So my name is Caitlin Lambert. I am so happy with the turnout for tonight. I'm really excited that people are interested in this topic. Uh, just like Sean just stated, this is my presentation, Women in the Marvel Cinematic Universe from Iron Man to Black Widow. So I really want to thank all of you for taking time out of your evening to hear me talk about fictional women with super superpowers or love interests, often wearing outfits that wouldn't really do much to actually help in a battle at all. Uh, but all jokes aside, I really do appreciate you being here tonight to hear me speak on this topic that was the topic of my master's thesis. So just out of curiosity, how many of you have ever seen an MCU project before in some capacity? OK. And how many of you know what the MCU is, even if you've never seen something or even, I guess, heard of it? OK, perfect. If not, we'll get to it. We'll cover it. Everything will be OK. I just appreciate everybody being here tonight. So last year, I conducted a feminist critique of various Marvel Cinematic Universe films just to highlight how sexualized and objectified women have been in the MCU, which is one of the largest franchises in modern history. I conducted this critique for my master's thesis, and I truly loved just taking a deep dive into this corner of pop culture that I really love and have spent a lot of time watching, filled with characters that I really identify with and care for deeply. So this specific presentation will discuss my observations and overall critique of over 20 MCU projects and how they construct and portray women as performed in my thesis. My goal for all of you tonight is to leave this presentation with a better understanding of the nuanced and subliminal forms of sexism found in the MCU to further help you gain some media literacy in recognizing these types of sexism, misogyny, fetishization, and objectification, say that four times fast, of women and others within media. So, backtracking for a second here, the Marvel Cinematic Universe, for those that aren't aware, is the media franchise consisting of various films and television and streaming series that tell the stories of Marvel superhumans and normal humans as well, with the original source material being the comics from the 20th century, so the Marvel Studios comics. The Avengers films are easily the most identifiable piece of MCU content. I'm sure you can pick out some characters that you're familiar with in this large collage here. And they include characters like Captain America, Iron Man, Hulk, Thor, Black Panther, Doctor Strange, and more. Did you notice that I didn't list any female characters? And that's on purpose, because women really aren't represented and promoted in the same way within the MCU. Real quick, there are going to be a lot of spoilers in this presentation, so you have been warned. Uh, you definitely can watch all of the MCU stuff knowing the content I'm going to be discussing tonight, but just know that we're going to be discussing spoilers up through Black Widow, Avengers Endgame, kind of that space. So the best example of women not being represented and promoted in the same way as men is with Natasha Romanoff, the, the Black Widow, portrayed by Scarlett Johansson, and she didn't get a chance to star in her own film until after her own, her own character had died at the kind of the end of Avengers Endgame. So it's kind of an interesting juxtaposition where she finally got to lead in a film after her character had already died within the canon. So her character was already kind of done away with, but they brought her back for one more project. The other big female-led MCU film was Captain Marvel, which many Marvel fans have expressed their distaste in the film. Personally, I really enjoyed it. I don't understand the vitriol, but I'm sure all of you can speculate where some of that vitriol comes from. The purpose of this critique was to act as a comprehensive feminist critique of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. However, it should be noted that this is by no means exhaustive which will be further detailed when we get into phase three and the start of phase four. Surprisingly, there actually isn't a ton of research out here about this. There is some studies that focus on one or two characters kind of throughout their whole character arc within the MCU, or you have a few Marvel characters along with some DC characters and so on and so forth that are overall surveyed and evaluated. But regarding what I did, which is a broad, comprehensive critique, that really hasn't been done before, and so my purpose with the thesis was really to fill that gap and hopefully provide some foundational research that then other researchers can build off of someday. Absolutely critique my own critique because this is totally biased as that is the nature of a critique, uh, but I hope that it can at least be the foundation for future research to come. So for tonight, I will spare you the nitty gritty details of my literature review and methodology as I really don't think that that's why you're here tonight. Uh, if you really want to know, I can share my thesis with you and you can read all the nerdy side about it all you want. But for context, I do want to provide the basic essential information to better help you understand how I approach this critique. So the methodology for this critique does not follow a model or a format found in any other study because I simply couldn't find something that really emulated what I wanted to do. 
Uh, I didn't want to use a study that used emergent themes as the method because this isn't a qualitative study, and I wanted to stay in that rhetorical critical space. So I essentially developed my own methodology of taking notes of selected films in each MCU phase that highlight various female characters that I selected, then identified themes specific to each phase and organized my thoughts in that manner. So, as we stated, this specific thesis is a feminist film critique, meaning that I use feminist film theory as the cornerstone and touch point to really ground all of my observations. I'll spare you the extensive history of feminist film theory and the related terms, but I do briefly want to touch on Laura Mulvey and the male gaze, feminist film theory as a whole, and then specifically the male gaze, which has become more of a buzzword in recent years. And when I refer to the male gaze, we're gonna be discussing it in the context of feminist film theory. So the definition that I provide may be a little different than what may be found in other academic disciplines. So in essence, feminist film theory observes and analyzes women's on-screen portrayal, trying to gain an understanding of their role within a film. Are they protagonists or do they exist just to bolster a male counterpart? Are they a love interest or do they actually serve a purpose beyond just being the girlfriend, the damsel in distress that needs saved? These are just a few of the many questions that I ask myself while conducting this critique. There may be some individuals in here who have done much more research on the male gaze, so please forgive me for providing a Cliff Notes version of the male gaze and what it is, but in the context of my thesis and tonight's presentation, the male gaze, like I said, in relation to feminist film theory, often refers to various techniques and trends across media forms that appeal to the male eye, both on screen and off, and what men stereotypically find attractive specifically within society. So I'm gonna really read from my notes here for a second because I wanna be sure to explain this the best I can. So Laura Mulder Mulvey first coined the term male gaze using Freud's psychoanalytic concept of scopophilia in Western filmmaking, most notably through the work of filmmaker Alfred Hitchcock. Scopophilia is the love of looking or taking pleasure in looking or watching. According to Mulvey, filmmaking techniques consider the viewer's subjects, connecting the audience's look with the director's or another creative's look, while the object being looked at is female. This creates conditions prime for women to be objectified when the viewer is supposed to have the same gaze as the director, which is where the term gaze in male gaze comes from. I do want to note that the male gaze does not apply solely to men looking at women. Rather, it refers to the audience and characters looking at other characters as visual objects to fulfill those scopophilic desires. And especially if produced or directed by a man are working to fulfill some type of male fantasy. In early Hollywood, this could be seen through the use of female characters either wearing very low-cut tops, form-fitting dresses, but also through portraying roles of being a doting wife, a very dedicated partner, and serving their husband to their full extent. Even today, the male gaze continues to be a way for female characters to be objectified, fetishized, and overall diminished, especially within superhero cinema and action films, and the seeming dominance of males in leading roles. So a common thread seen through my critique and in various literature, namely Mulvey's works, is women's construction as passive to an active male counterpart. This can be seen through a woman being a love interest, sidekick, doning wife, etc. And there is nothing inherently wrong with being any of these things on or off screen, but when a woman is reduced to being secondary to a man, especially when it isn't of her own volition, this is a key component of the male gaze. Now, you may be asking yourself why this research matters. Is this even really important? What's wrong with women not being the leads of films or being the heroes themselves? I wanna take some time to share some really important pieces of literature to further discuss the importance of this critique and also give you an idea of the magnitude of the MCU, the effect that media can have on consumers, the impact of positive representation on a population, and the harm that can come from poor representation. So as stated before, the MCU is a very popular franchise in the United States, with 54% of US adults aged 18 through 34 having seen at least one Avengers film at some point. Additionally, poor representation of women leads to lower self-esteem in the women who consume that media. And we'll kind of break that down a little bit more in a minute. As of 2021, the MCU is esti estimated to be worth nearly $53 billion, which includes box office sales, streaming, and merchandise. Uh, you can also include in that things like the Avengers Campus at Disneyland, all of the potential Disney merchandising that comes with it, and even the spin-off series as well, just things to consider in that number. The film franchise itself has grossed $26.6 .6 billion in total worldwide box office revenue as of June 2022, which really demonstrates the popularity and success of the MCU. 
53% of women self-report as fans of the superhero genre, which I think is a pretty significant number. And female-led projects are still considered to be financial risks, which then results in female-led projects to not be prioritized or put on the big screen. A big example that I like to give of this is regarding various Disney Plus series that we saw that came out, including WandaVision, Let's see, She-Hulk, Miss Marvel, and Hawkeye are the four that are coming to mind right now that are all female-led. None of those were opted to be blockbuster films like we see in the movie theaters. Instead, they all were put onto a streaming service. And this is me speculating, but I imagine it's because of this belief that there would not be the same amount of um, financial gain by putting them on the big screen compared to putting them on a streaming service, which of course, WandaVision is a series that did very, very well. Same with the other series, so hopefully that slightly proved things wrong, but that's just an example I like to give of that stereotype kind of being enforced within Marvel. Additionally, female audience members, as we kind of discussed, experience lower self-esteem after watching films where women are objectified. Women are underrepresented behind the camera, which then results in a lack of positive and authentic representation in front of the camera. Female college students, when surveyed about this, tend to identify and dislike the hypersexualization of female characters. And when women on screen, specifically leads, are hypersexualized, there are harmful effects on public health regarding female self esteem. And these portrayals can promote the objectification of women being societally normalized. So, just some research. I won't get any further into the nitty gritty research, like I said, because I'm sure you don't wanna hear every single bit of my literature review, but I think that this kind of gives some context into just how important this topic is. So for tonight's presentation, I am going to walk you through the first three phases of the MCU to demonstrate and exemplify the shift in how women are constructed and portrayed throughout the MCU. And I will briefly discuss the film Black Widow and also the series WandaVision, which are technically in phase four, but really help in signaling the MCU's move to more authentic representation of women, which we will get to. So before we dig into all of that, I did want to clearly state for you my argument here, just so you have an idea of what I was kind of using as a touch point to really help me stay focused when I was conducting this critique because my brain tends to jump down rabbit holes and I'm sure other people that do research know exactly what I'm talking about, but having this kind of central argument really helped in grounding all of my studies. So like it says here, I argue here that the construction and portrayal of female characters within the MCU has shifted from phase one where women existed as an object of desire and motivation to the end of phase three and beginning of phase four, with women moving into primary protagonist roles essential to the forwarding of the narrative arc and the whole of the MCU. So I do want to note that due to time constraints, I won't be going through every single plot line, every single detail of every character, just because we don't have the time for that. And I am more than happy to answer any questions you may have or smooth over any issues you might have discussing all this tonight. But I will be providing examples and will give you ample context just so you better understand what's going on when I provide different examples of things that are happening. So with that being said, we will dig into phase one. So to get started, the films that I selected as the films to take my observations on were Iron Man, Iron Man 2, Thor, Captain America, The First Avenger, and Marvel's The Avengers. So that's the first Avenger film. Uh, and you can see the years that those are released, which I think the years also play an important role in all of this, as you'll be able to kind of see a shift from a pre-Me Too movement to more of a post-Me Too movement, post being very kind of up in the air if it's really post, but the exemplars that I selected were Virginia Pepper Potts, who is Tony Stark's assistant turned CEO turned wife, Natasha Romanoff, Black Widow, who is an assassin who was trained in the Red Room in Russia and is really the epitome of the femme fatale archetype. Dr. Jane Foster and Darcy Lewis are two women who star in Thor, and they play a really key role in kind of helping to save the day within the Thor film. And then Margaret Peggy Carter is a US military operative who essentially ha helps Steve Rogers, I almost said Chris Evans, the overlap, it just, it's so much. Um, Steve Rogers when he is becoming the Captain America that we all know and love. So, just to dig in, 
Uh, we are going to be, like I said, discussing phase one, which marks the beginning of the MCU. So that's clear back in 2008. And the three themes identified in this phase are blatant sexualization and objectification of women, strong women reduced to secondary roles, and a reliance on tropes, fetishization, and fantasies. As with all three chapters of the critique, we'll also take some time to discuss the visual representation of women in this phase. So phase one of the MCU is the most obvious example of hypersexualization of women within the MCU through both narrative and visual representation. This is the phase where we see characters most often sexualized and objectified in outfits re revealing significant amount of skin or drawing the audience's gaze to their chest, while also creating women to be objects at Tony Stark's disposal and seeing them as nothing beyond a one night stand, for instance. Some could argue that Tony Stark is the epitome of the male gaze, as women practically throw themselves at him, but we won't get into that argument tonight just because that's not the focus of my critique, as I really wanted to stay focused on the women themselves. So Pepper Potts, right here, is introduced in this phase as Tony's right-hand man, which that plan word is very intentional to show that specific stereotype as the sidekick to a man often being another man, and she eventually becomes Tony's love interest. While Tony routinely objectifies and fetishizes the women that surround him, he seemingly treats Pepper as more of an equal, but only to a certain extent as she is his assistant, so there is that power dynamic at play. Eventually, the two enter into a romantic relationship, playing directly into the boss-assistant dynamic and placing Pepper into a position of passivity, which connects back to our discussion of the male gaze. This phase constructs women to be the ones in submissive roles to men and not in positions of power or leadership, or when they are in roles of leadership, still expected to follow the lead of another man, which is something that we see in Iron Man 2 when Pepper effectively gets promoted to the CEO of Stark Industries but still has to report everything back to Tony all the time, and she's technically the one in charge but still is having to answer to Tony. Natasha Romanoff, which I will show you here, introduced in Iron Man 2, is used as both support for Nick Fury and the recruiter for the Avengers, consistently subjected to wearing revealing clothing, even when combat, and flirting with enemies and allies alike. So this phase in particular relied on tropes on several other occasions to drive female narratives forward, with tropes used within this phase and the following phases being tropes that objectify women and put them into passive roles. Natasha can be categorized as a femme fatale character, which makes her character construction very seductive, mysterious, and calculating, using her body to get men to give her information or other resources. Pepper, on the other hand, is a damsel in distress on more than one occasion, a princess in need of saving by her prince, which is Tony Stark. One of the most verbally explicit examples of sexism within this phase comes from Joss Whedon's The Avengers in an interaction between Loki and Natasha Romanoff. In this interaction, Loki calls Natasha a mewling quim, which is a Victorian slang term that essentially means whining vagina. This is a sexist and derogatory insult, which can be equated to the modern American and British insult of calling someone the C word. I won't be saying the C word tonight, but Use your imagination to know what that word is. So using slang for vagina, anatomy belonging to the female bi biological sex is inherently derogatory and it still surprises me that that little bit of dialogue even made it into the final cut of the film. Natasha also experiences some hypersexualization throughout her appearance in The Avengers where she is wearing a skin-tight catsuit in battle and is first seen in the film restrained to a chair wearing a low-cut black dress. Although she has the upper hand, based on skill level, she is still being objectified visually and narratively in this film, using herself as a tool to get information out of enemies. So as you can see, that is the first appearance of Natasha on the left in The Avengers, and then that is her catsuit for battle. Um, and as you can see, even in the images and the stills portrayed, she's typically visually portrayed to be standing in some sort of seductive pose or just clearly being seen as an object for the audience to look at. On the flip side, Peggy Carter's representation is pretty unique compared to the other women in this phase, as she is represented as a strong, independent woman with her own successful military career who later becomes Steve Rogers' love interest, and that is a role that she pretty much has for virtually the remainder of her time in the MCU. Just to note, this critique only focuses on her appearances in the MCU, so this doesn't include her spinoff show, Agent Carter, which is something to keep in mind, but predominantly, Peggy Carter kind of remains this object of Steve Rogers' affection, and that's really what she's reduced down to for the remainder of her time in the MCU. 
There is some visual sexualization of women in Captain America, with Captain America showgirls wearing revealing outfits, especially revealing and scandalous for the 1940s that this film takes place, which by today's standards, this wouldn't necessarily be seen as anything too revealing, but when you scale it back to 1940s standards, this would be pretty provocative to be wearing. In contrast, Peggy, Star Peggy Carter is not visually sexualized or objectified, often wearing pencil skirts and blouses that are fully buttoned and very appropriate for the 1940s. Generally, women in both of the Iron Man films are repeatedly sexualized visually, wearing little clothing and at Tony's beck and call. Every girl in those films, except for Pepper, seems to be trying to sleep with Tony Stark, and that results in women wearing outfits to show significant amounts of skin and cleavage to try and catch Tony's eye. If you haven't seen the Iron Man films in a while, I really recommend looking back on those because it's pretty shocking at the kind of stuff that we didn't really bat an eye at in 2008, which is 15 years ago. Pretty crazy to think about. So within all of phase one, I argue that both Darcy and Jane from Thor are often not objectified and sexualized, with Jane really only being subjected to objectifying tropes in phase two. However, their, rep their representation and the Thor film itself is some of the best in phase one, especially compared to both of the Iron Man installments. We see Darcy and Jane each wear outfits, like shown here, that are functional and not overly revealing, and their characters each play a key role in saving the day in Thor's plot and are not in as passive of roles compared to Pepper or Natasha. So with that, we're going to move into phase two, which again, like before, these are the films that I selected to take my notes on, Iron Man 3, Thor The Dark World, Captain America The Winter Soldier, Guardians of the Galaxy, Avengers Age of Ultron, and Ant-Man. And then we carried over some of the same exemplars from the previous phase since their character arcs were still happening uh, as the films have progressed, but we've included Wanda Maximoff, who is later the Scarlet Witch, Gamora, Nebula, and Hope Van Dyne, also known as the Wasp. So phase two experienced very similar themes within the films, with some films in the phase having more authentic representation of women than others. Natasha Romanoff in particular has some very complicated representation in this film, going from, or for, in this phase, excuse me, going from slightly improved representation in Captain America Winter Soldier to drastically more sexualized in Age of Ultron. As she is now a full-fledged Avenger, this continued sexualization comes, unfortunately, as no surprise, as studies have shown that women who have larger roles in action films are much more likely to be hypersexualized. More of Natasha's interactions play directly into the male gaze, namely with her constantly being a sidekick and prop for flirting with throughout both Winter Soldier and Age of Ultron. In Winter Soldier, she plays a significant role in the film, aiding Steve Rogers or Captain America, but the two's dynamic toes the line between romantic and platonic. So there are some interactions between Natasha and Steve in this film that seem more flirtatious than friendly, and when I'm referring to this film, I'm referring to the Winter Soldier. The two share a kiss on a mall escalator when attempting to evade some enemies. Natasha essentially convinces Steve to kiss her because she tells him that public displays of affection tend to make people uncomfortable and Steve agrees. And the two kiss and she asks him after they kiss and they effectively evade the enemies, you still uncomfortable? And he states that's not exactly the word that I would use, which is referring to the fact that he does find her attractive and he did enjoy the kiss. She also kisses Steve on the cheek at the end of the film as a goodbye when they go their separate ways to take care of their own missions. And there is even a comment made in the film about an injury Natasha got years ago that left a permanent scar on her abdomen, which she says, bye bye bikinis, refer referencing that she doesn't want to wear bikinis out of worry of not looking good in them. Which Steve then sarcastically remarks how poorly she must look in a bikini, again suggesting that he finds her attractive. So these small choices in dialogue really kind of show that even Natasha thinks of herself as an object, that she's only something to be looked at, and she realizes that she can use her body to get through certain situations. And it's really interesting because after this film, there really is never any other romantic relationship between Steve and Natasha. So it essentially was kind of used as a plot point in this film and then goes away. But don't worry, she'll be a love interest again and we'll get into that very shortly. Despite being a top build character in this film, Natasha is a sidekick and eventual love interest within this phase when she kind of enters into a relationship with Bruce Banner or Hulk and she is significantly reduced to secondary roles among her male counterparts in both of her appearances and overall experience in pretty poor representation. 
She was also subjected to the femme fatale trope again, as were Pepper and Jane Foster with the damsel in distress trope. Natasha was really objectified in this phase through her use as that love interest for Steve that just didn't really go anywhere. And I always like to include the movie posters for Iron Man 3 and Thor because one, they're basically identical besides just swift swapping out the characters, but the pose is the same, and it really places the characters into this position of being damsels in distress because they're physically leaning on a male counterpart to save them. And if you know the plot line of both of these films, they are absolutely damsels in distress. Uh, and it's really unfortunate because they are each individual characters very strong and independent, but as you can see, we are set up to see them as characters that need to be rescued by the big strong hero that is Thor and Iron Man. Objectification also shifted in how it is shown with the introduction of Gamora and Nebula, who are characters that are used as disposable weapons by their adoptive father, Thanos. So Gamora is on the left, Nebula is on the right, and they are essentially adoptive siblings, adoptive sisters, who are often pitted against one another to become the best killers in the galaxy to a certain degree. They are disposable weapons that Thanos uses, sending them off on, some could even argue, suicide missions because he doesn't really care about his daughters despite them being his adoptive daughters. And we especially will get into that with Gamora later on in phase three. It's really interesting to see the shift in objectification because it isn't the same type of objectification we've seen. They are literally being used as disposable objects versus Natasha is being used as an object for her body and is kind of more of the narrative objectification. Avengers Age of Ultron, directed by Joss Whedon, provides some of the most problematic instances of perpetuating the male gaze and includes dialogue that is potentially damaging in a few different spots. So the first of these, you may recognize this scene from the film. Uh, there's a big party that all of the Avengers are attending, and as you can see here, right here is Thor's hammer, Mjolnir, and effectively, what they are all trying to do is see who is the most worthy to lift the hammer to see if anyone else other than Thor is able to. And whoever is able to lift the hammer then becomes the ruler of Asgard. So Tony Stark makes a comment about acting, asking if he can enact Prima Nocta if he becomes the person able to wield Mjolnir. So is anybody familiar with what Prima Nocta is? Okay, so for those of you that don't know, essentially it is the right of the first knight, which is the idea that the ruler of a specific kingdom, area, what have you, has the right to bed any female of their choosing, essentially whenever they want to. So this specific dialogue choice is very damaging because it is placing it in the minds of people watching that Tony Stark still views women as um, really disposable objects for the purpose of sex. And that is something that is carried over definitely from phase one. And again, I'm very shocked that that, that was a line that could pass through, but I guess that's not my call to make. And the other glaring moment that sticks out within Age of Ultron is when Bruce Banner, Hulk, and Natasha are speaking about being monsters. And Natasha essentially expresses that she feels like a monster due to her inability to have children. So part of her training in the Red Room when she was wrapping up becoming a Black Widow is to undergo an involuntary hysterectomy where she no longer has the ability to have children because there's something in her dialogue along the lines of children just be getting in the way of things in terms of completing missions and things like that. So, including dialogue in the film that insinuates that Natasha feels like a monster for her inability to have children is very problematic and damaging to the audience. If you have an audience member that identifies with Natasha who either can't have children or has chosen not to have children, and hears Natasha say that she thinks she's a monster for it, that audience member could walk away from viewing that film, feeling as though they have something wrong with them or that they are making a wrong choice by not having children, which relates back to the earlier literature that I shared regarding the negative effects on public health that can come from inauthentic representations of women. Although these two specific examples are by no means the only instances demonstrated in phase two of poor representation of women, I think that they really demonstrate just how poor representation was in phase two, especially when it comes to constructing women outside of their physical appearance and looking at their narrative construction. 
Phase two introduces Wanda Maximoff, a character who is hypersexualized visually, but not so much narratively, which is a really interesting dynamic. Her outfits, as you can see here, usually show extreme amounts of cleavage and skin, drawing the audience's eye to her body, but there is often dialogue within the films and different moments in combat that demonstrate that she has more power than any of the Avengers have ever encountered before. And that power is later echoed and further amplified when she is able to almost single-handedly bring down Thanos. The only way that he was able to stop it was by effectively send, raining bombs down on his own people just to kind of get her out of the way, which I think is a really interesting juxtaposition with how sexualized she is visually, but then narratively is just so powerful. So within my thesis, I did include a chapter that discussed Joss Whedon's influence on the MCU and how his gaze shifted the portrayal of various women in the MCU, like how Natasha saw a slightly more authentic representation in Winter Soldier and then really poor representation in Age of Ultron. Whedon was also the director of the first Avengers film in phase one, where we saw really poor representation of Natasha, which we covered. And Whedon has actually been facing accusations of inappropriate conduct on set, and he has not directed an MCU film since Ultron. Keep in mind, again, that Ultron was slightly pre-Me Too movement, and once everything kind of came out surrounding those allegations, his time in the MCU was done. Considering that the two films that saw extremely high levels of sexualization and objectif objectification of women in phases one and two both had him as a director, he had influence in the construction and representation of these women, and that did need to be discussed within my critique. There is a whole other research paper that could be done on strictly Joss Whedon's impact on the MCU, but I didn't go down that route, but it absolutely is something that exists and I think should be conducted. That being said, the film directly following Whedon's exit, Ant-Man, was a true palate cleanser and completely flipped the femme fatale trope on its head with the introduction of Hope Van Dyne, seen on the right, and her non-sexualized wardrobe and role as a powerful woman who helps the more expendable Scott Lang learn how to use her father's technology to accomplish a mission. Hope contrasts Natasha significantly and provides a different perspective on the femme fatale trope, which I would argue slightly modernizes the trope to not be as objectifying and instead is used as more of a tool to construct a powerful woman. The film as a whole introduced a tonal shift that really led into phase three. So phase three is when we really start to see picking things up with more content that was released. So this obviously is the largest phase in terms of what I evaluated. Captain America Civil War, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2, Thor Ragnarok, Black Panther, Avengers Infinity War, Ant-Man and the Wasp, Captain Marvel, Avengers Endgame, and then WandaVision and Black Widow are the two phase four projects that I included in this as well. So we see a lot of the same exemplars from previous phases, and we added in Carol Danvers, also known as Captain Marvel, Valkyrie, and Women in Black Panther. Phase three is the phase where I argue that the shift is most evident, especially coming off of the heels of Age of Ultron. However, I personally was surprised at the level of objectification that actually remained in phase three, because it was much more diminished and not as frequent or as obvious, but it still was there subliminally, and I found it very fascinating to kind of pick out those instances within phase three. This type of construction, of it being really poor construction of women, was not as widespread or as common as previous phases, which does demonstrate that argued shift. So objectification is still a notable theme, but it's taken a different form in this phase. As we've discussed, Nebula and Gamora have regu regularly been objectified by their father and also by other men within the MCU. And Gamora is actually used as a catalyst for driving two separate male character stories forward, that being her love interest, Peter Quill, or Star-Lord, and then her adoptive father, Thanos. Gamora's death within the film is used as a catalyst to drive both Peter and Thanos to extreme decisions within their own character arcs, because if Gamora had not been sacrificed, so many things wouldn't have happened within uh, Avengers Infinity War. Meanwhile, you have Natasha sacrifice herself for humanity, which is another instance of using a woman as a catalyst for driving plot lines as she dies instead of her friend and fellow Avenger, Clint Barton, or Hawkeye. Prior to the release of Black Widow, Natasha's sacrifice was seemingly more justifiable as it seemed as if the only people Natasha had were 
her Avengers family, who were her chosen family. However, once the Black Widow film was released, the audience then learned that Natasha did in fact have kind of this secret family, which stripped away some of the justification, I know for myself it did, of her sacrifice in Endgame, and it really made me question, along with a lot of other audience members, if she was the right person to die, because she had a family of her own that she was choosing to sacrifice. Choosing being up for debate as well. Natasha's death is a great example of a phenomenon called fridging, which relates back to a comic book trope where a male hero's girlfriend is killed, dismembered, and stuffed in a refrigerator. I believe it was Green Lantern. I, it, that's really the term, and it has stuck. And fridging is used as a term for killing a female character with a close connection to a male character to then drive his own plot forward. Uh, Fridging was another rabbit hole that I really wanted to go down, but my thesis was already 125 pages, so we weren't going to go there. Uh, but I think it is something worth discussing, just because fridging is something that we often see. And out of anything in here, that might be the thing that some of you may be able to take away from this and apply to other content, just because oftentimes women are killed and used as a way to drive male plot lines forward. So the fridging argument is applicable to both Natasha and Gamora as their deaths exist solely for the purpose of acting as a domino to lead into something else within the plot line. Phase three also provides more diversity and inclusion for people of color with Black Panther's release and the use of women as the individual surrounding and defending the Black Panther T'Challa. However, this section in the chapter was unfortunately the shortest section because there is still a big lack of representation for women of color within the MCU. Of course, within phase four, we've seen a lot better representation. We've seen the success of Black Panther Wakanda Forever, along with films like Shang-Chi that include more women of color. and. Big steps forward for sure, but in terms of what I in particular studied and what my cutoff was, there unfortunately was just not a lot of representation for women of color at this time. So it's still an area that needs significant work to be representative of women as a whole and for women of color, but I think that some of the best representation for women in general was seen in Black Panther with how important these women were to literally protecting the life of their king. Women finally begin to move into true leadership roles, like with Natasha becoming the leader of the Avengers once Tony is lost in space, and Wanda and Carol Danvers are the only two characters who almost single-handedly defeat Thanos at different moments in Avengers Endgame. The Avengers really wouldn't have stood a chance without Captain Marvel and Wanda, so I really like to point out just how tough those two characters are. Women finally were put into primary protagonist roles in phase three, and especially in the two projects we'll discuss in phase four, which contain some of the best moments for authentic representation in this critique. In fact, phase three was when we finally saw a female character leading an MCU film. It took a few years, but we got there, with the release of Captain Marvel. Carol Danvers is a superhuman who, or superhumanoid, who teams up with Nick Fury and eventually plays a key role in saving Earth after the events of Avengers Infinity War. It took several years, but the MCU finally had a female-led project, and it features a character who was not hypersexualized or extremely objectified in her role. In fact, I argue that she has some of the best visual and narrative representation of women to date and is surrounded by strong women as well, but other visual representation took a lot longer to catch up with the positive shift in narrative representation. Visually, Wanda and Natasha are still often sexualized, but by phase four, they each experience far less visual sexualization. Within phase three, their casual outfits are not really revealing, but instead more practical and authentic to what would be expected when not in combat. However, Wanda's combat outfit, which you can see here on the right, with her corseted top really drawing the audience's attention to her chest, is definitely highly sexualized. She does not see improvement to her combat attire until WandaVision, which then we actually do see her cleavage covered, and she's still in a form-fitting outfit, but it's much more practical for a superhero to be wearing. Natasha, on the other hand, has a much more practical combat outfit and still wears her cat suit, just not quite as tight or as unzipped as in earlier phases, which is a big step in the right direction. By phase four, her last MCU appearance, her wardrobe is not sexualized in both casual scenes and action sequences. And as a whole, the visual representation of women in the two most recent phases has a big shift from phase two and is very practical and far less sexualized, which is a big improvement from where the MCU began in 2008. 
I do want to take some time to talk about Black Widow just because I find it to be a very unique film as the film was directed by a woman, Kate Shortland, who actually acknowledges that Natasha Romanoff was originally created to directly appeal to the male gaze. And she took it upon herself to work with Scarlett Johansson to directly combat some of those stereotypes and decisions made in previous films that directly played into the male gaze. Although Natasha's starring moment came after her character had died, the film was a significant step in the right direction and provided more depth for the character. There is still a significant amount of research that can be done in this area, specifically with qualitative methods. I think something like interviews with the creatives at, MCU, at the MCU, within the MCU, I should say, could provide more insight into working towards preserving continuity and character construction when shifting from one director or writer from project to project. I think that that's a big issue that we've seen with a lot of the construction, is you have one director in this film because it's a large Avengers film, then you're shifting to an individual film that's focusing in on one character, and it creates a lot of issues in continuity. So if there could be more effort done with that continuity, I think it could go a long way. Additionally, much more research can be done on the phase four women, which have has really just expanded, especially from when I did my thesis. And we're starting to see more women, more women of color, and also varying sexualities. And on a more broad note, research on the superhero genre to learn more on audience demographics and who is watching these films may further play a role in influencing character construction on screen. The resounding conclusion that I came to from this critique is that the work done has indicated a shift toward more authentic representation of women, but there is still a significant amount of work remaining, especially regarding those who don't fall into the confines of being white, cisgender, and or heterosexual. Even if you aren't a fan of the MCU, superhero content, or even movies, my hope is that you can take the content that I discussed tonight and apply it to your own media consumption through small things like noticing when a female character is subjected to being the damsel in distress, or if a woman repeatedly wears attire that is excessively revealing or is, less, or is sexualized by others within that film or television show. Awareness of these small but still impactful forms of sexism and objectification of female characters will hopefully lead to positive change toward more authentic representation of women. Thank you for your time, and does anyone have any questions or comments? I have a couple of questions, yeah. actually, so um, in your research at all, did it, I know you did more of a critique of content and stuff like that, but did you look into um, like when Black Widow was, was released versus when Shang-Chi was released, how Black Widow was released directly Mm -hmm. to be streamed right away. Right. And um, Shang-Chi actually got a theatrical representation. Yeah. Um, do you think maybe that had some factor within how well received Black Widow was in kind of a feminist? Yeah, that's a really good question. for failure, quote unquote? Yeah, sure. So uh, for the people viewing at home, uh, the question is essentially if the release of Black Widow and the release of Shang-Chi, if I studied it myself and if I kind of my own speculation, I guess, about if I think it was impactful. And unfortunately, I think part of it was the COVID pandemic because we couldn't really, that was right when things were opening up, and opening up enough to go to movie theaters, but people still weren't entirely comfortable going to movie theaters. So I think that was part of it. Uh, I didn't do any research on it just because my cutoff, I think Black Widow came out in June and like, within two weeks, I was like, okay, I'm done with my thesis. So I wasn't able to really evaluate it in that way, but I imagine that there is probably a significant amount of research that could be done now because I'm sure there's a lot of factors that play into it. I think the pandemic's a big one. I think also the fact that it's a female-led character who canonically was already dead, so people might be done with the character already. That probably played a part, and I think because it was female-led, I think people weren't super excited about it. I know there were a lot of people that didn't really enjoy the film, but I loved Black Widow. I thought that it was a great film. I think it was a good way to kind of say goodbye to Natasha's character and learn more about her. Um, but Shang-Chi is also a great film. So I think there's a lot of research to be done. I personally haven't done any, but I think that it's something worth looking into because I think there's a lot of factors to look at. I think there's also the interesting angle too, that it is people of color in Shang-Chi versus a woman in Black Widow. So to see box office numbers for the two could be really interesting. So that's a really great question, a really good perspective to look into. Yes. So I know in film studies and sometimes in literary studies, we use the 
Bechdel test. Uh -huh. I was just curious if you ever used that in your own research. Yeah. So the question A is regarding the Bechdel test, which I don't want to, I know what it is, but I don't want to inaccurately explain it. It's like very three really simple questions. Uh -huh. It's like, how many women are in the film? Uh, that might be wrong, but it's like, do the women in the film talk to someone other than a man? Uh-huh, yes. Do they talk to other women? And do they talk to other women about something other than men? Yes, yeah. I couldn't remember the specific ones, but so it's great that you bring that up because one of the people on my committee is in the arts space. So she recommended conducting the Bechdel test and I was going to go that route, and I've actually seen some TikToks that talk about that I think only two MCU films out of the 27 or 29 of them actually passed the Bechdel test, which is really, really sad. And I also, when I was talking to my thesis advisor about it, uh, he didn't think I should go that route necessarily because there's not a lot of formative foundational literature on it. Not that it isn't a formal test that you can conduct, but it's a little more informal. And I think he was just hesitant for me to use that because it could be something easy for me as a master's student for someone to be like, well, that's not a real test, but there is validity in using it. So I didn't use it, but it is something that I really considered incorporating into my thesis just because it's pretty jarring when you use it and look at how media actually constructs women because they exist for men so often. So great question. I, yeah, I appreciate you bringing that up. Anybody else? Yeah. I think it's, Mulvey has been around for a long mm -hmm. time and visually not, not much has changed. Yeah. I mean, I used it years ago when I'm probably older than everybody in the room. But um, not much has changed visually. Mm -hmm. When I go to see a Marvel movie, I mostly go because my husband loves action movies yeah. and I can sit next to him and say, okay, she just killed 10 men, but the camera's going to can the hand to her butt when yep. she walks away. Because that's what's in the yeah. And that's how I judge. Totally. Things. But I, the ones I do like are Guardians of the Galaxy. Yep. And do you think that the um, Gamora and Nebula uh, relationship challenges somewhat that you have been uh -huh. as machines and as yeah. Thanatos' weapons because they get together, at least in two, mm -hmm. and start interacting. Yeah. And then the third woman, who's the bug woman? Mantis. Yeah, yeah. Mantis. Um, she, she does her saving, mm -hmm. not by fighting or with powers, mm -hmm. but by intuition yeah. and empathy. Yeah. So that those series, it seems to me, really are in phase four. Yeah. And I want to see what the third one. Is. Absolutely. Me too. I'm really excited. I think that's a really great thing to bring up regarding Mulvey. So I actually submitted the first chapter of this specific paper to a conference for the Central States Communication Association conference later this month, and it was chosen for that. And some of the feedback that I got kind of stated that there's some people that would argue that Mulvey's findings are outdated, but I would really push back against it because considering it's 2023 and I can still apply it to this, and there really isn't anything to be concerned about, not concerned about, there isn't anything, well, to be concerned about in her research regarding representation, I think speaks a lot to one, how little change has really been made, and two, how society continues to shift and how women are objectified visually. And regarding Gamora and Nebula's relationship, I really think that it does somewhat challenge what we're seeing. I mean, I think it would definitely pass the Bechdel test, honestly, out of the scheme of all of them, just because of the interactions that the two of them share. Although sometimes the conflict is surrounding Thanos, so it is about a man, so I guess it could maybe not pass the Bechdel test. But I really like the representation of women in Guardians of the Galaxy. And it was honestly difficult to critique in the sense that most of the time it's just blatant visual sexualizations, then I can kind of use that as my starting point and be like, okay, and there's a lot of narrative sexualization or objectification, but it was a nice challenge with Guardians of the Galaxy because all of the objectification that we were seeing was through them being objects in the eyes of Thanos. So it really was a different angle to look at objectification, and I was kind of excited when I found that because I was able to identify that objectification doesn't mean just 
someone's body being used for sex or for pleasure or what have you. It can literally be being used as a weapon. So yeah, I'm excited for the third movie as well to see what they do. Yes, all three are women of color. And I actually do, yeah, I do, and they're aliens. That was a really interesting, that was a really interesting discussion that I was having within writing my thesis because can you call them women of color because they're aliens, because within the universe they're aliens, but portrayed by women of color. So it's a really kind of complicated way to look at it. And I actually talk about within my thesis that Mantis is portrayed by um, a woman of color being Asian, and she's French and Asian, so it's a very interesting kind of combination uh, in terms of who she's representing. Um, so yeah, I think that I really like how women are portrayed in Guardians, I guess, is kind of the roundabout thing I'm trying to say. And I appreciate that perspective as well regarding their interactions kind of combating some of the things we're seeing with Laura Mulvey. Anybody else? Yeah. I think it's fascinating that Iron Man came out in 2008. You're 11 years old. I doubt that you and I sat and watched that together. Mm -hmm. I watched all the Marvel movies as they came out, mm -hmm. you doing your research, I rewatched mm -hmm. all of them. Iron Man 1, I was like a little appalled. Iron Man 2, I'm like, holy cow, I don't even like this character uh -huh. anymore. Yeah. And so it was really, it was really eye opening that I watched them all yeah. before, obviously, uh -huh. with a male gaze, not even realizing uh -huh. that, and then re-watching that with a more intellectual approach and, a, and an evaluation yeah. of it, and it, it it was just interesting how awareness certainly changes things, yeah. and I think that your research and, and other research that's going to happen will drive cinema and media yeah. into a more neutral Mm -hmm. field, you know, and so uh, that's the hope anyway. Yeah, so. that is the hope. Yes, I agree. Well, and it's interesting because I talk about in kind of my, at the very beginning of my thesis, talking about my inspiration for it, which was as a kid, I think the first movie within the MCU I remember watching was Captain America, the first Avenger, and I loved how Peggy Carter was constructed because she was super cool, super tough girl wearing a pencil skirt and heels and red lipstick but still was kicking butt and taking names and I loved it. And then as I got older I saw Iron Man 2 which of course technically came out before that one but I just saw it when I was older because I didn't get super into the MCU until I was actually in college and I was like how the heck did we takes such a big step backwards because Natasha's, I, Natasha's one of my favorite characters in the MCU and I get so upset when I see how much she was sexualized and objectified and you can even find interviews with Scarlett Johansson talking about that she didn't like how she was um, portrayed in the films. Not that she was treated poorly on set but just that the construction was not what she wanted for her character and that's why it was so great that she kind of had some redemption within Black Widow and getting to portray the character how she wanted to and she, you can still be sexy but not be showing cleavage and having every shot go right to your butt because that is a common trend in a lot of these things so I'm glad that me doing this research helped in kind of shifting how you see things because it's I hate to say that it ruined watching movies for me but it kind of did because now every time I'm watching I'm like oh cool Fetishized, yeah, I know. <laughs> I know, that's what happens. You get into academia and just the joy sucked right out. No, but I'm I'm really I'm really glad that I was able to do this and um, have a different angle, I guess, of looking at how women are constructed and all that fun stuff. So yeah. Um, does I know you talked about the male gaze too a lot in this. Um, does that also did you talk to and also kind of include a little bit of the male power fantasy? That's also included with the movie. Mm -hmm. I which didn't. Also, I do yeah. think applies with like the attract, like the conventional attractiveness of the women. Mm -hmm. is the man wants to put themselves in the man's shoes and be fawned over by mm -hmm. all these attractive women. And totally. I'm just was curious if that yeah. was at all present. I didn't include any of that. I really wanted to keep my mm -hmm. literature and my theoretical framework really focused on just like the foundational tenets of Laura Mulvey specifically with all of her focus on the male gaze. I did briefly talk about the female gaze just because it's a highly kind of contested area of 
if the female gaze exists, and that's honestly an area of research I'd like to get into later in my academic career. Um, at one point, I said to my thesis advisor, I kind of want to do a paper on if the female gaze exists, and he said, nope, you're going to wait for your dissertation to do that, because that's way too big of a project. And I said, OK, sounds good. So I think it'd be cool to do some research into if the female gaze actually exists, or if a patriarchal structure has made it so a female gaze is impossible, because I can kind of see both sides of it. We see people talk about the female gaze um, being more focused on the emotional side of men, but that also may just be how women are told we should see men differently. And it's just, it's really, it's a rabbit hole. So I didn't go into you know any of the male power fantasy at all, but I think if I was to do something focused on maybe Tony Stark, for instance, I would have gone more that route. I just wanted to focus more on the male gaze and how it specifically affects the women, because all of this really kind of came from just the visual representation, and then I went from the visual into the narrative. Yeah, but I appreciate that perspective. How about Woman King? I mean, that maybe kicks all of this into the fresh. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the female gaze there. Mm -hmm. You've got the female warriors who have female bodies mm -hmm. that are not all alike. If you take Gamora's head and <laughs> you know, Nebula's head, and uh -huh. you know, if, you, if you take their heads off, they all have the same bodies. Yeah. And every one of these, really, with maybe a centimeter or mm -hmm. two difference in the measures, 16 inch waist, 34 DD bust, and, yeah. you know. Yeah. But in Woman King, the first thing I saw was, you know, the women soldiers run by, and by God, they've got bodies where, you know, they can kick ass. Oh, yeah. And you believe it. You Heck, know, yeah. These others, you know, it's fantasy. But, totally. But doesn't that establish at least a step toward female gaze? I would think so. Uh, I think female gaze is so tough because I go back and forth with it whenever I think about it because... I go back into Marxist theory and patriarchal structures and all of these different kind of critical angles. And it all comes back to me that the patriarchy is so deeply embedded in all of our societal viewpoints. And it, it will take a lot of work, maybe not even ever enough work, to counteract that. So as much as I want to believe and hope that there's a female gaze, and I, I to a certain degree I believe there's one, I also think that it's really hard to prove that there is one uh, just because of how embedded the patriarchal structure is in our society. But I think that there are a lot of films that at least play to more of what women want to see for their representation. And so to a certain degree, yes, do play to a female gaze. But in terms of actually having like a concrete definition for a female gaze, there really isn't one that's out there yet for it. So I hope within my lifetime we can kind of get an answer to that. But Woman King is a great example. Even some of the more recent, even some of the more recent uh, MCU films have gotten a lot better since doing all of this research. And I think part of it is time. Time since the Me Too movement, we're starting to encourage more women to be in these creative roles. And it goes back to that statistic that I shared, or the research that I shared, about when women are underrepresented behind the scenes, then women are going to be less represented in front of the camera. So when we start seeing more women telling women's stories, I think that that's when we're really going to start seeing the change. And that is something I talk about in my thesis for future research and just my own overall conclusion, that it isn't to say men can't tell women's stories, but women are going to be able to better tell authentic women's stories. Just like if I were to write a book about telling the story of a man, I've never lived as a man, so I don't think I can play as much to the authenticity of it personally. Uh, but other people, I'm sure, would very much disagree with me on that. But I think that that's why I really love Black Widow, is because it was a woman directing the film. Even though the script itself was written by a man, we still had a woman in charge of the visual component of it, which was such a step in the right direction. So my hope is that cinema continues to get more and more inclusive and representative of so many women and you know, just everybody in general. Yeah. Thank you so much. Anybody else? Well, thank you, everyone. Uh, any questions?